Improving Network, State Prescribing Action Group, and I'm Kelly Piper with California Healthcare Foundation. Um, as always, we continue to focus on two things in this action group. One is how do you create an infrastructure in a clinic to support safe opioid prescribing? And the second is how do you teach residents? Well, what type of adaptations to curriculum does it make sense to do to, to make sure that in your residency clinic you're treating pain well and you are um, in emphasizing safe prescribing techniques. Um, we realize that this is often challenging to do in resource poor settings. So based on feedback from many of you, we decided to do a, an hour on what are the ways that you can teach residents some basic behavioral health management even when you don't have abundant resources such as behavioral health staff or psychiatrists or case managers and those types of things. So again, we're going to um, be focusing today on what you can do even without having staff to ensure both you're adequately screening for behavioral health issues and that you're addressing them as part of a comprehensive treatment plan. So we're going to start with Shrona Romerist. Um, she's the Director of Behavioral and Addiction Medicine at Highland Hospital. And then after Sharon completes, um, we'll be switching over to Diana Coffa, the Residency Director of San Francisco General Family Medicine Residency Program. As always, we welcome um, your, your feedback and we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A um, in between the presentations. Okay, so um, Sharon, why don't you get started? Okay. So today, what we're going to be covering is um, comorbidities, particularly depression and PTSD and its interface with our chronic pain patients who are having problem opioid use. So we're going to look at opioids and benzodiazepines. And I'm going to uh, give you some ideas about how to engage your patients within a short primary care visit into um, different kinds of mindfulness practices. So let's start. Um, um, so we're going to return again to this slide. I, I know you're all very well how chronic pain is a comorbid condition. And it's reminding us that chronic pain and substance use disorders, more often than not, are comorbid conditions. And they intersect with other psychiatric conditions, right? So that's more common than not. It's important our residents understand that. And another way to look at this is when the body has been physically violated, which many of our patients are uh, trauma sufferers, physical and sexual trauma survivors, it is more easily triggered into chronic somatic pain states, both from states of anxiety and common painful conditions like osteoarthritis. And so what happens is an unconscious vicious cycle gets set up that begins where unprocessed emotional wounds worsen the experience of physical pain, and then physical pain in turn worsens mood states. So it's important that we train residents to screen for certainly a basic condition like major depressive episodes. And um, to remind, but it's also as we screen for that, it's important to remind them that a depressed mood state is a natural human condition. And it's just like chest pain. It may have multiple etiologies as the slide shows. So the major take home point here is to look for the root cause and not just pull out a prescription pad and write for antidepressants, which actually also have issues with these patients. Um, many of you are familiar with the PHQ-2, which is really the first two questions from the DSM-5 um, diagnostic category of uh, DSM-5 diagnosis for major depressive disorder. So it's a sort of a tuna net question. Um, and basically, it will capture a lot of people who don't have major depressive disorder, but it will also capture those who do. So you ask these two questions. If both questions are negative, you can worry, can move off of worrying that there is a major depressive disorder behind the sort of dysthymic mood that you're seeing. If it's positive, then the next step would be to administer a PHQ-9, which is really a basically the DSM-4 criteria plot applied into questions. I think most of you are familiar with that. If the PHQ-9 shows a score of 15 or greater, that is consistent with major depressive disorder. Frankly, less than that isn't. Um, and you may want to go forward with more aggressive treatment if it's 13 or so. Under that, I probably wouldn't. And also, uh, this also when, when, when this is positive, the PHQ-2, of course, you want to make sure your resident is doing a good suicide screen as well. All right. So it's important uh, within your 
the next system to somehow operationalize this. Uh, you know, so it's best to operationalize a major depressive disorder screening, uh, ideally through your EHR. Um, you want to, you know, figure out what's going to be our standardized check-in process. Uh, certainly with our chronic pain patients, when a patient presents for chronic pain, I think that should, this should be done. Uh, and the other time is when there's a change in condition, it should be done again, because if the patient's coming in with more pain or something's shifting on that somatic level, it could be a depression is emerging. emerging. Next is you want to find, figure out a standardized follow-up interval to measure the impact and outcome. And again, when we're treating for a major depressive disorder, we're going for actually full remission. What often happens in primary care is that PHQ-9 will come down a few, quite a few points and people will be settled with that. We really want to get uh, full remission if possible. Although again, with this group of patients, that can be hard. Um, and then finally, you really want to think about your exit plan with antidepressants. Uh, I think, you know, met too many primary care providers keep patients on antidepressants open-endedly as a lifelong treatment. Really, uh, and, I, and I, I see this in my practice, people coming in with the consequences of that, like no sexual, hyposexuality, not really having the three-dimensional emotions. There's lots of things that are a problem with that. Um, and of course, this was never studied for that. So uh, likely over time, these medications chronically down-regulate important neurotransmitter systems, such as the norepinephrine serotonin system. And unless someone has a recurrent major depressive disorder, at, that, at this point in time, that, those are the patients we're going to keep on open-ended antidepressant treatment. Most patients don't have that. So those patients who don't have that, but have major depressive disorder, one episode or maybe a second episode, you want to keep them on the medication from anywhere from 9 to 12 months. If they're very resistant, it could be as short as 6 months. Um, then all of these medications, as we're all learning, have really terrible discontinuation side effects. So we want to very slowly taper patients off these meds. And the one medicine I want to make a mention of is venlafaxine, which is often used for chronic pain and depression that has notorious uh, withdrawal side effects. Even if a patient skips a dose, it can create a great deal of anxiety and trigger a lot of uh, pain, and then actually opioid misuse, I've seen this. So uh, it's critical that patients, especially on that medication, take these meds daily and not skip doses. If they're unreliable, I probably wouldn't start them on these meds. I mean, I'd be very careful, you know, to work with them around it. Um, and uh, again, you know, I think this is a big background, unseen, but probable pro cause of anxiety in these patients that then causes pain flare-ups and then opioid misuse. And if I could just jump in, when we try and present these models, we're trying to say, here is what you could do with a lot of resources and the gold standard, and then here's what you can back into if you have limited resources. Many of you may know Project Impact that came out of Washington, but it, it empowered care coordinators to check in with patients regularly, either by email or phone, and the concept was if you start a treatment, whether it's counseling or an antidepressant, and then at a certain point you check it, if you're not getting um, any benefit, then that's the, that should result in a tweak to that treatment plan. And the same thing with what Jerome was saying is after a period of time, if you feel like this person is stable, again, it's a way to regularly check in and make sure you understand the impact of, of what you've done. And that can be a way to um, capacitate your team or an MA to do that work. Okay, so um, we went over this question in another webinar. Uh, it's important, of course, to screen our patients with chronic pain for PTSD. Well, actually, to screen them for trauma. So this is a good generic trauma question. Have you ever been harmed physically, sexually, emotionally as a child or an adult? Now, remember, most patients who have suffered trauma, if they say yes, you want to, you know, invite them. It's often very vulnerable, painful. It's hard for the resident to hear as well. Uh, what the headlines of that trauma was, but that it's important for the physician to hear what that was, what they actually went through. Um, now, all patients who have suffered trauma suffer emotional wounds, but the minority, only the minority, and most residents think all patients who have suffered trauma get PTSD. It's actually the minority get PTSD. So here's a quick way to do uh, a screen for PTSD, which is I teach residents to screen for just the PTSD intrusive symptoms 
with, those, with these two questions. In the last week, have you had thoughts or memories about what happened come up, and do you have nightmares associated with what happened? If no, then they don't have PTSD. And um, so, so that's, you know, just a quick PTSD screen. Now, if it's yes, you may want to go on to have the patient fill out on their own as the resident goes and presents or something. Uh, the PTSD checklist civilian for aversions is on the website www.pcbehavioralhealth.com or you can just pull it off the web somewhere. Um, again, I've highlighted here the two, two with arrows, two intrusive symptom uh, screen questions, so you may want to use this in your EHR. And I want to remind people, it's a good way to tr uh, teach residents about PTSD that the DSM-5 now has four categories of symptoms. So there's the intrusive symptoms, the memory, so to speak, the avoidance of, uh, symptoms, those are the ways, you know, anyone who's going through intrusive memories are going to want to avoid those memories. And negative alterations in cognition and mood, which looks like depression and often gets misdiagnosed as major depression. Uh, the most common misdiagnosis I see among our re residents is, is diagnosing major depressive disorder and missing PTSD. And then the fourth category of symptoms is hyperarousal symptoms, uh, which, and that often those patients will present in primary care with, the, uh, with insomnia or they just seem really irritable and difficult to deal with and that's part of that cluster. Um, okay, so let's go on to treatment here. So the, Really, to me, the most important aspect of PTSD treatment or trauma treatment is counseling. Okay, more important than meds. Meds help stabilize symptoms, basically, in my view, both to make the patient more comfortable and also to give them more access to counseling. So if, you're, if your clinic has this available, a warm handoff is, uh, you know, to a uh, health psychologist is great. If they're Medi-Cal insured, you can refer them to a planned mental health line. If you have an integrated model um, and, or thinking about that, seeking safety groups are really easy to learn and most basic health psychologists or social workers can learn this very quickly and run this. And uh, another more complicated group to run with a little, needs a little more training is dialectical behavior therapy. And then a lot of good recovery outpatient groups do deal with trauma as part of that. Um, mindfulness practice, I'm going to, we're going to be talking in a minute about how to gauge patients in the primary care setting in this. Sleep hygiene, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, going towards cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, not that you have to do that, but certainly helping the patient access sleep hygiene and, and giving them some education. And on a psychopharmacology level, if you can use two-for-one medications with our chronic patients, such as gabapentin, uh, an off-label use that many of us use it for is for a anxiety. Also, gabapentin can be a three-for-one medication because gabapentin many of us use for uh, relapse prevention from uh, substance use disorders, al alcohol in particular, but virtually any of them. So if you can use gabapentin at the lower doses for anxiety or relapse prevention, at the higher doses you need it for the uh, you know, neuropathic pain, you've got one medicine to cover three symptom groups. Then, of course, is the tricyclics and SNRIs with their issues, their respective issues. Remember, tricyclics um, are type 2 antiarrhythmics, and you don't want to give it to patients who can't handle that. And then the SNRIs, as I've just described, with their withdrawal issues. And they're also very activating, by the way. So that's another issue with that. So anyway, you know, you have to just be skilled in how to use them. We want to avoid sleep medications such as Z drugs and benzodiazepines. And Prazoz, and I want to really encourage you to use that medicine for your PTSD chronic pain patients. Not abusable, very effective for insomnia and actually for other PTSD symptoms being used all over the VA now. Um, and remember with these medications you have to go very low and slow. These are very somaticizing patients uh, because of the pain, the body violation, all that stuff. They're going to react to all the side effects of all your medicines. It's not just the psychopharmacology. So in general, you want to go very low and slow. And I just want to mention a Journal of General Internal Medicine study that just came out. And they found that there was an adjusted odds ratio for um, overdose was highest for those with depression, that kind of makes sense, and high opioid dose of greater than 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent. Now, for those without depression, this was kind of interesting. The overdose risk increased with antidepressant use and was greatest for short-term use versus none in those without depression. 
I believe it's because people are skipping, they're, they're using it, they're, they're stopping the messaging too quickly, they're getting that, um, re, that anxiety, which, the withdrawal anxiety stuff, or they're missing doses, and that may be flaring up and pushing patients over the edge who already are at some suicide risk. Uh, it did found the study, this makes sense, that long-term antidepressant medicines for those with depression were protected from overdose, okay? So yes. kind of a complicated issue here. Go ahead. Yes, sure, and good question. I never thought of phrases in as being a two-for-one that you could treat your prostate and you could treat it. There you go. Can there you, you know. tell a little bit more about how phrases can work? So it's it, it it's because mean? it's an uh, alpha-2 blocker, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's, not, it's not just for insomnia. We use it only for PTSD insomnia. Okay. Yeah. Although, uh, so it's, it's, it's a patient who has PTSD or on a PTSD spectrum, okay, and they're having nightmares and activated because of that. All right. Um, benzos and opioids. Okay, we all get this, but make this message loud and clear with resonance, okay? Benzos cross-react with opioids. They also cross-react with alcohol. Throw benzos, opioids, and alcohol together, and you get, you know, a, a much greater OD risk making this a really potentially lethal combination. Now, in your alcohol use disorder patients who are on opioids for chronic pain, and, they, and you know, you've worked with them and they've decided to get off of alcohol, which would be great, and lower, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, um, you can certainly treat minor withdrawal. Actually, I treat, in our primary care setting, I encourage our residents to treat minor withdrawal as outpatients using gabapentin protocol instead of uh, Ativan. As you can see, that would be safer in these patients who are also on opioids. So I would refer you to Hugh Murick's work from the Medical University of South Carolina for uh, details on that gabapentin protocol. Very easy to use and much safer than a benzo protocol for minor withdrawal of alcohol. Okay, approach to benzodiazepines and opioids. Obviously, we want to stop this from the front end. Avoid new starts, okay, period, <laughs> really. Uh, very few exceptions. I don't even know if there's an exception, but really try to avoid this. Secondly, make sure, again, we're checking cures. One of them, another reason to check cures here is that commonly, uh, psych, my colleagues overprescribe benzos as far as I'm concerned, especially as an addiction psychiatrist, I see the fallout on this. Uh, so they may be prescribing benzos and the primary care provider is unaware that, you know, they're, and they're, they may even be unaware that the person's on narcotics you know, Vicodins or whatever. So really important to, A, get some re release of information, talk to each other, but certainly minimally check yours. Now, for those patients that were inheriting on, your residents are inheriting on benzos and opioids, um, you know, both, both can be tapered down to safer levels, one. So even if you can't get them off, at least you can get them to safer levels. Both take many months of tapering. Now, that's not possible for a patient who's got a full-blown, moderate to severe addiction with benzos or opioids, then they're going to need inpatient addiction treatment. But for many of our patients, you can take it really slow, get them down. I actually, in primary care, we almost always can get people off of benzos as long as they're around, you know, in an addicted realm. Um, and you can just take many months to do that. In fact, let's, um, you know, and again, so both are slow going. You have to allow those neuroreceptors to recover, basically. All right. And then remember, for opioids, of course, to reiterate, many of, some patients cannot get off of them. They're going to need opioid replacement therapy if they, you know, can. All right. For benzo withdrawals, again, we want to teach our residents that benzos, like alcohol, can be life-threatening if it's abruptly stopped because of seizures. So it's never, and the patient, you need to, most importantly, train the patient. You don't want this patient going, I don't have copays, and then abruptly stopping their benzos. A, you know, there's a small seizure risk. B, it's going to make them so anxious, they're going to up their opioids. So, you know, or maybe start drinking alcohol. So it's very important our patients are covered financially in terms of copays and things. And, and have access to getting their prescriptions refilled. Um, you want to taper slowly at about 10 to 20 percent of peak dose. You'll typically begin to see some benzo withdrawal in, in, in some patients, not all. Um, often this is transient and with good support, some even bone support, they can get through that. Um, and I want to mention, as we've mentioned here before, protracted withdrawal syndrome. It's also called PAWS, P-A-Post-Acute Withdrawal Syndrome. 
Um, both opioids and benzos can cause this. I think this is frankly a bigger problem than the acute withdrawal. We can get through that. That's the first week, and we can actively treat that. This is what drives the illicit use. This is why people need opioid replacement therapy. And with benzos, um, you know, many patients can get through this okay, but some patients don't. And how this presents is there's anxiety, mood instability. To me, they look like ADHD patients. They're a little disorganized with executive uh, dysfunction, insomnia. Sometimes there's sensitivity, light, touch, and paresthesia. All right, so what are our alternatives to treat for benzos with treating anxiety in these patients? First of all, I like, you know, again, we need to think about what is causing the anxiety. You know, we don't want to assume the anxiety is just their baseline chronic state. Maybe it is. But is it chronic intermittent withdrawal because they're skipping doses of opioids? They're skipping doses of venlafaxine. They're skipping doses of benzos, we, you know, or, or other medications that may cause that. So, one, we want to be very careful. We've gone with, through the patients who are out there day in terms of caffeine, other stimulant drugs, over-the-counter, recreational drugs, even chocolate, you know, what, what's going on with that? And, you know, remember a lot of our uh, low-income patients uh, have really, unfortunately, terrible nutrition, maybe eating a lot of, uh, you know, food industrial complex food that actually has causing stimulation, by the way. And then, of course, things like untreated PTSD or un other untreated major anxiety disorders. Now. In treating anxiety and chronic pain, we certainly want to, uh, I'd like to introduce to you the concept of getting our patients engaged in mindfulness practices, and that's not just breathing, relaxation breathing, it can be yoga, tai chi, and other mind-body practices. Uh, you want to meet them where they're at around that. Exercise, of course, which, you know, is, just good, is good for this and many other things. And then, again, gabapentin. All right. So what's the alternatives for insomnia? Um, again, you've got to think about other causes. Is this person, you know, a binge drinker and that's what's going on? Or are they a drinker? You know, the biggest cause of insomnia, period, <laughs> is drinking. And even for those of you who are light drinkers, one to two drinks can cause, help people go to sleep, and then there's a rebound effect. Okay, so look at that. Sleep apnea, does this person need um, a, a sleep study? Environmental, a lot of our low-income patients are living in really crappy environments. There's a lot of, you know, they may, there's a lot of noise. They're, they may be sharing a room with other people snoring. Another thing I think is important to think about is mattresses for these patients, especially with chronic pain. You know, the, it, many of us have had the experience, you know, what, oh, I need to change my mattress and my chronic pain went away. So that's something else to think about. Again, activating drugs. Um, sleep hygiene, I think, is something really important to teach our patients, and you, even the brief, even one part of that, which is wake up at the same time each morning, which forces a person to sleep, and not staying in bed beyond 20 minutes when you're not sleeping, having them get up and do just really low, you know, things. And a third thing, which is extremely important, is asking people to stay off of electronic devices from 30 to 45 minutes before bedtime. Uh, it's, it can be hugely uh, impactful. And so I'm going to refer you all to the Stanford website on CBTI, which is basically sleep hygiene that they applied in a you know, more structured fashion. Another good uh, intervention is progressive muscle relaxation, which you can get. There's free podcasts, there's free MP3 files. It takes about 20 minutes, a half hour, and the person puts on earplugs. It really helps people fall asleep. And then if you're going to go towards medication and you're already using gabapentin, double their, you know, you find a dose of gabapentin that doesn't make them dizzy or sleepy, but helps either the anxiety and or pain during the day, and then double that dose at night. You can use low-dose antihistamines, over-the-counter Benadryl, half a tab, a little bit of PRN melatonin, and then praise those in if they have PTSD. And again, trazodone is fine in certain cases, but I wouldn't just do a knee-jerk left right trazodone. There, there are issues, as I've just described. Okay. Could, you, could you just say one more word yeah. about the Stanford program in terms yeah. of how a resident could teach that CBTI? Well, yeah. I mean, you're not going to do full CBTI, but, um, you know, on my website and there's others, you can, you can have a handout. And, you know, we have our health coaches or the residents go through some of these basics. And, you, again, you may just highlight three things that they can pick up on. And if the patient reads the stuff, sometimes they go, oh, I didn't know that, you know, they're, right? So it's, it's kind of an educational thing. 
Okay. And um, now we're going to talk about mindfulness approaches to chronic pain and substance use disorders. Now, you know, typically encounters between chronic pain patients facing problematic substance use and clinicians are, you know, there's, between the patient and clinician is often fraught with lots of anxiety and frustration. And I believe that integrating mindfulness-informed approaches widen these clinical encounters from a kind of reductionistic focus on the prescription pad to active engagement in a framework of mind-body healing. So the goal of mindfulness practice is reflective engagement with the whole experience of pain and addiction. So we, you know, try to somewhat replace the prescription pad, pad with breath. <laughs> and, you know, it's good for the clinician also, and both the clinician and the patient can better relax. So what is mindfulness? And here's uh, a kind of modified description. You know, it's like focusing a spotlight on the here and now, and mindfulness practices intentionally attend in an open and discerning way to whatever is arising in the present moment during, uh, in the present moment. And during mindfulness meditation, all experience, good or bad, is observed and accepted without judgment. Now, whether it be drug cravings or freedom from drug cravings, physical pain or being pain-free, pessimism or optimism, okay? So the whole point of mindfulness is not to push away pain or make it go away. It's to watch its transient nature, actually. It can go from really intense to gone, and that is actually quite helpful for pain patients. You may have all heard of this mindfulness-based stress reduction. Hopefully, it's occurring in many of your um, uh, medical centers. Uh, this is designed for chronic pain. It, start, it has, uh, it's an eight-week standardized course with people who are well-trained to do it. You know, they have to go through a certification. Uh, it's a Theravada-style boot sitting breath-based meditation, body scanning, and half the yoga postures. And um, the body scanning, again, which I mentioned, really is, is the way you, it, it uses attention to sequentially guide someone throughout the body to observe the sensations in each region without judgment. And the half the yoga postures, cultivate awareness of the mind-body experience and non-harming attitudes towards the uh, body. And often patients will, I have patients in my practice go through these courses and they will pick something that works best for them. So it basically promotes a non-judgmental uncoupling of pain sensory aspects from its evaluative and emotional dimensions. And from its outset, it has been studied in chronic pain. There was a review identifying mechanisms that mediate um, mindfulness-based interventions, most of which are based on MBSR, uh, and that rated strong evidence for lower cognitive and emotional reactivity and moderate evidence for improved mindfulness and lowered rumination and worry. And uh, this slide just reviews some of that evidence. And basically, you know, whatever its evidence, it involves low side effects. <laughs> And I think it should be offered, to, you know, you, once you incorporate this in your practice, it should be offered to all patients, not all patients are going to accept it, and try it on an individual basis to find out if it's going to be of help. And I want to mention now two, um, other, uh, or two other approaches that were uh, based on MBSR. So this built off of the MBSR and it added mindfulness-based CBT relapse prevention. And there was an RCT comparing this with treatment as usual, which was actually a 12-step support group. So people were in 12-step and going to support groups. So I thought that was a fair comparison. And the patients were assigned to either uh, mindfulness-based relapse prevention or relapse prevention, just the cognitive part of the relapse prevention, okay? So that was another thing they compared to. And they found that mindfulness-based relapse prevention and relapse prevention had lowered the risk of relapse of substance use and heavy drinking. But at 12 months follow-up, the MDRP patients reported significantly fewer days of substance use and decreased heavy drinking compared with relapse prevention and treatment as usual. And finally, there's this newer um, approach called mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement, which was designed for problem opioid use in chronic pain patients. It builds off of NBSR and mindfulness-based CBT, and it adds elements from um, positive psychology like reappraisal training and savoring. And so what they found is that the more patients had significantly greater reductions in pain severity and interference than a support group that was derived from the matrix model, which is another standard kind of uh, re uh, recovery group thing. So I thought it was a good comparison. And that was maintained by three months. And it seemed that the more patients had um, more increased non-reactivity, 
and uh, re reinterpretation of pain sensation. And then compared with the support group, more patients uh, had significantly less stress arousal and desire for opioids and were significantly more likely to no longer meet opiate use disorder criteria immediately following treatment. However, these effects were not sustained as follow-up. Now, there, there was one little tip I found interesting from their study, which I think you can teach patients to do, which is once patients have learned a little bit of um, breathing relaxation practice, to have them do that for two minutes or even, you know, five breaths, I mean, to make it as simple as five, right before they take their opiate dose. And they found when they did that, it's kind of like a sacred pause before you take an opiate dose, that the opiates were either not taken or the dose was not uh, elevated. So I think that's something we, why not try, okay? So how do you teach mindfulness in short visits without being a master meditation teacher? We don't need to be master meditation teachers, we just need to refer them to that. But how do we engage them? So I'm going to teach you right now something called soft belly breathing, which uh, I learned in uh, training at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine from James Gordon. Here's a link to the Vimeo, which he shows you how to do it. But I'm going to do it with you in case you forget what I just did with you. And um, this has been used cross-culturally in various uh, refugee camps with VA patients, so it's quite, seems to be quite effective cross-culturally. All right, everyone, here we all are. I don't know where you are in the middle of the clinic, but Okay, go, go with it and we'll all relax a little bit here. Okay, so I'm going to teach it to you the way I would teach a patient, all right? So everyone um, sit up, on, sit stuff. if you're standing, sit down, sit on a chair, don't lean back on the chair, sit in an upright posture, uh, put your hands on your lap, and you can either close your eyes or look down at the floor, okay? So everyone want to try that, get into that position. Okay, now, with your eyes closed or looking down at the floor in a nice upright posture, head over your shoulders, shoulders over your hips, um, I want you to think from zero to ten what your current anxiety is, um, zero being none at all, ten being the worst anxiety you've ever had, all right? Now, I want you to take a deep breath in through your mouth, and, I mean through your nose, take a deep breath in through your nose, and as you inhale through your nose, let your belly rise. So a deep inhale down into your belly, let your belly rise, and as you exhale, exhale through your mouth. So inhale through your nose, deep down into your belly, exhale through your mouth. And as you do that, um, as you inhale, you may silently say to yourself, soft. And as you exhale, you may silently say, belly. Inhale through the nose, soft. Exhale through your mouth, belly. And you may notice that your mind is going to thoughts or maybe even to pain in your body somewhere. And as that's happening, you can just say thinking, or pain, and then go back to the soft belly breathing. And as you're breathing, you can visualize your vagus nerve starts in the um, abdomen, it goes up to the heart and the lungs, and it ends at the base of the brain. And as you're doing those long exhales through your mouth, it's actually triggering that nerve to, to release rest and relaxation chemicals to allow your body to rest. Okay, you can now slowly open your eyes. Come on back here. And now rate your anxiety from zero to ten. Now most people it will have dropped. I did this with a, an intern boot camp. All the interns starting at Highland Hospital from surgery to medicine were there. We did this. Some of them were ready to fall asleep as the day before their start their internship. So I know it's effective. Um, so what do you do with this? So this is what I call a taste of mindfulness, and it gets them um, engaged. And usually people find this a very positive experience. And then we kind of talk about what may work for them to get continued work. So one is just getting them to do maybe two minutes to five minutes twice a day as an action plan is, is a start. 
Another is I really like to refer patients who get into this to further work with this. So for some patients, it could be, hopefully if you have an MBSR course, this is a direct lead into that, um, or an MBRP course. If you, or for some patients, the Headspace app is a wonderful app. Um, patients, residents, doctors, people I know use, and it starts with two minutes a day of mindfulness breathing training. And then um, they can uh, be referred to yoga, tai chi, whatever classes, or local meditation center training. And then you want to make an action plan and check back with them. Okay. And I will just remind us all that part of us being able to do this work with patients is we have to empty our cup and go into um, a centered uh, present space in order to expect our patients to do the same. Well, thank you, Sharon. That was really helpful. It, um, again, we're trying to give you that spectrum of what to do if you had lots of resources and how to um, tailor that down to the type of time residents have in clinic. Can you talk more about pause and the clinical context in which we would see that? Yeah, so the page is going to look like, um, so you, let's say you're going to take them off of benzos. And they're going to, you know, you've said, oh, great, we've successfully taken them off. We did it really slowly. But then they're coming in a little anxious, depressed. They're having these visual things. There's, it just seems like another mental health problem is emerging. And I want you to think about, um, and, and again, it, they can even look like ADHD. They're, they're going to say, I'm cognitively a little fuzzy. I don't feel right, doctor. I'm anxious. Um, you know, one of the options is that they're actually having pause and not another newfound uh, mental health problem. And what's, a, what's your approach to managing that? Well, actually, by the way, I was just thinking of a patient I saw in primary care at Highland um, who came in who had been on Suboxone uh, and then was taken off Suboxone because family said, oh, I, we don't want you to do it to opioid. And he and ended up... Ended up um, you know, coming in with, quote, ADHD, and it was really paused. So the clinical approach may be that you, uh, you know, you could try, um, you could try low-dose SSRI, like Selexa and see if that helps. Um, sometimes you're going to, you know, if it's really quite bad and it's, if, you know, once in a while you may have to use a little bit of a low dose of the benzo again, but very low. But normally we try to avoid that. Another thing I would try is gabapentin with those patients. And um, I would try some sort of time limited, you know, uh, holding of them and maybe uh, work with a health psychologist to help them come up with other ways. But again, some patients' brains just, and this is a really small minority, and you really rarely will see this really will okay. need to go back on benzos, but I would try other things before that. Thank you. Sure, now, by the way, the opioid oh, patients, on the other hand, those are the patients who, you know, probably need to be backed on Suboxone or whatever. I see. Methadone, usually Suboxone. Uh, Sharon, there's a question from Erin Lund. Um, Erin, your line is unmuted if you want to ask it. I was just wondering about um, use of clonidine for mm -hmm. anxiety. If you have a substance use history, it's something I've mm -hmm. used a lot in my buprenorphine patients, and I've found it in general helpful for their anxiety, not just in the literal sense. Yeah, I mean, clonidine certainly has been used when when they're going trying to take patients off of opioids. You know, that is, uh, it's probably got some similar effect to brazosin, you know, alpha blocker. Um, I, you know, I don't generally use it chronically for anxiety, but you could, and you could also, again, another two for one if they have hypertension, you know, and you have a choice there, and you can go with clonidine, and they have anxiety. We, I have suggested that to our residents at times. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, using least amount of pharmacology as, as possible for a whole variety of reasons, but also to give the message to our patients that pill, you know, it's not a pill for every ill, right? So that would be great. You can certainly use that. I'm wondering if any of you on the phone have ever tried to have residents do some brief mindfulness in um, in a visit and how well it's gone. This is Diana. Even though I'm one of the panelists, I'm going to jump in and just talk a little bit about my experience um, 
doing this with residents in the primary care setting. Um, I actually um, developed a couple of handouts for residents to use that describe a specific breathing practice. We use the 478 breath, but it's very similar to the breathing practice, practice that you just had us do, Sharon. And with a handout that residents can give patients and then they can both follow the handout together, I've found residents are totally game to try it and generally successful. Um, and we've used a similar thing actually to guide people through uh, doing a little bit of sleep hygiene, uh, CBT, or just basically sleep hygiene counseling, right? Just having a handout that um, lists some of the changes we recommend people make and then having the resident and the patient go through a, kind of a shared decision-making process, a little bit of motivational interviewing to figure out which of those changes the patient wants to make, you know, circle those changes on the handout and bring it back to the next visit and talk about it. So I think there are ways we can facilitate these conversations with simple tools for residents. Okay, thank you. Other, other comments? Yes, can I speak to that? I, I do, I have practiced um, mindfulness with the residents, but I find it challenging when they're in with their patients. And I, I appreciate the suggestions of the handouts. I think that would help kind of give some space during the time um, they are with their patients. The other thing is um, I make sure we teach this, and, and our, our residency program director is really into it. We teach it actually. Now we're teaching it, like I said, at intern boot camp. I teach it when I do anxiety lectures. By the time, you know, we make sure the residents know how to do it because we want them to actually do it for themselves. Um, so the handout is absolutely fantastic, of course, and there's also that Vimeo, by the way. But if the resident really learns for themselves how to do that, especially that soft belly breathing, it's a very simple technique. And I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention three things with that. It's not uh, Vipassana meditation. What it is, it's concentrated meditation. You're using a, a mantra, which is soft belly, and you're using a visualization, a medical vis visualization. All that's purposefully in there um, and makes this pretty effective. So if the, if the residents have really learned it and you're integrating it all over the place in your training, then they, you know, a handout's great, but they also don't even need a handout because they're learning to do it for themselves as well. I really like that idea of teaching residents to come into a room as an empty cup because I remember being a resident and you're so wound up all the time that it's hard to imagine any of my patients felt relaxed when I walked into the room that wound up. And so. You know, my experience so far has been that the resident will be introduced to these practices and they won't, it won't get revisited. And the same thing happens with the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's one of our goals is maybe de to develop more of a curriculum where the, we really revisit this several times a year, teaching them these practices, and they're more likely to hand that on to the patient. That's been the biggest challenge to, for me because I, I haven't found anything that people come back and say, oh, yeah, that really helped. Um, one thing that I've had more luck with is the Stop, Breathe, and Think app. Um, to me, it was a little more navigable than the Headspace, and it was, and it's free. Um, but that's the only time I've had had some luck uh, with getting patients to really, you know, start to adopt some of these things. It's been a challenge. You're absolutely right, and that's why. But the where we've had luck is you, the patient, if they're open to it. You yeah. have to get engaged beyond you. Don't try, you know, we don't expect you to be a cardiologist. I certainly don't expect my residents or me to be a meditation teacher. We need yeah. to get the, re the, the uh, patients engaged in further training. And, that, and without further training, you're absolutely right, it won't work. So yeah. this is, that's why I say it's a taste of it. Um, the idea is really to get an action plan set up, whether it's an app like the one you suggested or another app. Or in our area, we have various meditation centers, including the East Bay Meditation Center, which is a very culturally diverse place that also even has a meditation time for people with chronic conditions. So you have to know the resources in your community, if you're, you know, robust resources like here or elsewhere, but find out the resources that your patients, depending on their cultural perspective, may be willing to access. And it's really working very individually with engaging them. This is an engagement tool to help them go for further training. 
And again, sure. ideally, I think we should all be having MBSR courses as part of the uh, insurance plan should be funding these. I mean, it's very effective. And that would, you know, yes. this would be try it in the room, see that work, go to an MBSR course. Again, not every patient would, but, you know, that's the point is access to further training. You're absolutely right. Without that, it won't, won't stick. Thanks. Anyone who has children knows you have to tell them seven times before they remember anything, and, <laughs> and it's frankly, it's probably worse for adults. We probably need to hear things many, many times. Yeah. So, true for our patients and true for us. I'd like to introduce uh, Diana Costa. She's going to build on what we've talked about. We've heard several people be interested in more detail about how to do group visits again in our resource poor environment. So, we charged Diana with walking through group visits for pain management and with some of the details of of how they did at San Francisco General and some advice for the rest of us. So Diana. So yeah, this conversation is actually, it feels like a very good transition because um, certainly my experience in the primary care setting is I can maybe do a two minute little deep breathing thing with somebody and then I have to move on to the next thing and we have so many other things to talk about that maybe I'll come back to it the next time I see them, but maybe I won't. And so. It's in the group visit setting that I get to go back and touch in on these exercises over and over again with patients so that they can actually develop skills with them and I can find out if they're working or not. So I am, um, I'll just, my disclosure here is that I love group visits. I think they're the coolest thing in primary care. I think that if primary care became group visit based, it would be a million times better than it is now. So that's that's my bias. I think group visits are the future. Um, at least I hope they are. So um, let's talk about some of the reasons that I think groups are so cool. One is that they improve patient access. So one of the things that, that I personally struggle with is I really think that most patients, particularly chronic pain patients, need more than the 15 to 20 minutes we can give them, right? They, they seem to need long, long opportunities to share their stories and feelings with us, and we don't give it to them. Um, and I love that with a group visit, you can give people time and you can retain access, right? You can still give access to many people in an afternoon um, while giving them some time. So um, the other thing that I find particularly meaningful and useful about group visits in the chronic pain setting is that isolation is a defining feature of the chronic pain experience. And if you really start talking with people about what their chronic pain has done to their life, one of the things you will hear almost universally is that it has isolated them. They either um, feel like nobody understands them. Every time they talk, it sounds like they're complaining and nobody gets it. Uh, they can't go out and do the things they used to do, and so they're saying no to every invitation from all of their friends, and eventually their friends just stop inviting them out anymore, and the same with family. Um, they're not employed, so they're not connecting that way. And they also describe this uh, sort of rising irritability, right? Over time, they become more and more irritable, less and less patient, and they actually start deliberately isolating themselves to prevent themselves from yelling at people or breaking their relationship even, relationships even further. So it's really sad when you hear people talk about what it's done to their relationships. And I would encourage you when you're doing an assessment of chronic pain, ask about the impact of pain on their relationships. And often you'll hear some, um, some really important stories. So putting people in a group setting helps them rebuild this sense of connection and, uh, and relationship. So in a way, I feel like it actually begins to treat some of the actual pathology that's leading to suffering. You're not you're not treating the you know joint inflammation, but you're treating one of the primary causes of suffering that they're experiencing. Now, what might you be trying to accomplish in a group visit? I make this list because what you're trying to accomplish is going to dictate the kind of group visit that you're you're going to run. And there are multiple kinds of group visits that we're going to review today. So you might be trying to treat the pain. You might actually be trying to get the pain score down. You might be trying to treat the suffering associated with pain. And as I was referring to earlier, there are a lot of causes of suffering that might not actually be the joint or the nerve. It might be the social isolation. It might be um, the cognitive distortions and the depression that has come with it. It might be the sense that 
of guilt, like they deserved it, they did something to cause this pain and bring it upon themselves. There are all kinds of things that can be leading to suffering that we can intervene on in a visit, in a group visit. Uh, we might be trying to provide an alternative to medication and thereby reduce opioid use in our clinic or in a particular patient. We might use a group to orient patients to clinic policies, right? So if we have a policy that every patient needs a urine drug screen annually or quarterly or whatever our policy is, it's useful to make sure that they're oriented to that so it doesn't become a point of contention with the primary care provider. So group orientations are definitely a reason that people do group visits sometimes. Uh, you might actually do group pain agreements, right? Instead of having the same conversation, you know, every year for your 20 chronic pain patients, bring them all together, have a group conversation about what a pain agreement is and why we do it, and, um, and, and do that as part of your orientation visit. Sometimes people use groups to prescribe opioids, so you're just going to bring the same group of people back every month and keep the prescriptions on schedule. Um, you can use a group visit to assess for signs of opioid misuse. And then, of course, in our setting, we use group visits to train residents. It's a really unique way to teach residents about a different perspective on the chronic pain experience and a different perspective on chronic pain treatment. So given that, I think of three basic categories of group visits. There are orientation groups, there are medication groups, and then there are therapeutic groups or psychoeducational groups. And I know that all of us on this line have different levels of access to behavioral health providers. Uh, and so I'm going to try to talk about each of these groups. What would it look like if you, if you have a behavioral health provider who can do the group and if you don't have a behavioral health provider who can do the group? But I will say before I do that, that if you have limited access to behavioral health providers, like if you have just the one person in your clinic who um, teaches residents behavioral science and, and not somebody else, this is actually a pretty high volume way for them to capture a lot of patients, right? If you put them in a group, they can see eight, ten people in an hour and a half. Um, and it, it, in, in many ways, it's a very efficient way for them to provide patient care. Okay. So let's talk about orientation groups. Um, a, a patient will usually come to an orientation group once, maybe twice, depending on how much material needs to be covered. An orientation group can be run by a health worker, by a behavioral clinician, by a provider. It's really up to you what you have access to in terms of staffing. Orientation groups can also be quite large. I've, I've seen people do orientation groups in the, you know, 30-person range. They can be large. It's probably much easier to manage if you're more in the 10 to 12 person range. Um, and how frequently you offer them is going to depend on how big your panel of chronic pain patient is, patients is. So what we're going to do in an orientation group is provide just a brief overview of what chronic pain is, talk about how is it different than acute pain, what are the options for treatment. You're going to discuss benefits and risks of opioids and really like teach patients about what are the downsides, what are we worried about, and what do we expect to see if we're seeing improvement. You're going to provide an overview of your clinic policy. Uh, and then as a group review and sign the pain agreement. And I know this sounds really novel and really, or maybe not, but it sounds really different to to many of you than what you're used to doing one-on-one -on -one with a patient, discussing these kinds of sensitive matters as a group. I think one of the nice things about it is it, um, it kind of relaxes the conversation, right? It's, it's, this is normal. We do this with every patient who we start on opioids. We bring them to an orientation group, and we go through all of this together. There's no judgment on you as a patient. We just order urine drug screens on everybody, and we do this pain agreement with everybody because these medications are so dangerous. Um, and so I think it normalizes the conversation in a nice way. Uh, I'll show you, this is, this next slide is, is the kind of conversation that I think is really useful to have um, in terms of an overview of chronic pain. So you can start your, your group off with this basic grid. And what I typically do is I just write, a, I have a whiteboard, right? You write acute pain next to chronic pain. And then you write that left column time course, quality of pain, location of pain, cause, treatment, 
And then as a group, you go through together. What's the difference between acute pain and chronic pain in terms of time? And one of the patients will raise their hands and say, well, chronic pain lasts a long time. And you say, yes. And so you write that up on the board. And so as a group, you build this grid, right? We talk about the differences in the quality of pain, often sharp for acute, often aching, burning, tingling for chronic. And of course, these are generalizations. But they help, what they help to do is highlight the fact that chronic pain is a totally different beast than acute pain. And the punchline comes in this last line here when we say the treatment. So for acute pain, medication is great, right? If you have appendicitis and you get a shot of morphine, your pain will feel better. If you have a broken arm and you take a pain medicine, your pain will feel better. But in chronic pain, the medication doesn't work so well anymore. And that's when we need to get creative and think about other ways to treat the pain. So that's how I, a nice way to give an overview so the patients, as you move forward in the conversation, can understand why you're talking about non-opioid approaches to pain in addition to opioid approaches. This is, I'll say too, this is actually not a, not a bad idea when you're starting opioids with anyone or when you're trying to talk one-on-one -on -one with a patient about moving away from medications and over to other treatment modalities. The next thing that's useful to do right up front as part of an orientation group is just talk about what do we mean by multimodal approach. Yes, we're going to spend the rest of today talking about opioids, but let's just really quickly look at what other options are available. And I think, I can't remember if I, I don't think I have shown this slide to you guys before. Um, so this one, I just put a grid up on the whiteboard, right? Medications or pharmacologic, physical, complementary and alternative, cognitive behavioral, or usually for patients, I'll write thoughts and feelings there. And then you ask the patient, what have you guys tried for your pain in each of these categories? And as a group, we come up with a list of all the medicines they've tried, the physical therapy and the different exercises and the surgeries and the complementary medicine. And uh, we come up with a list that looks something like this, where we realize that there are loads and loads of options available. Um, and you can even, in your setting, talk about you know, what is the low-cost acupuncture option? Is there somebody who does that out here? Um, what do we have available in our system for you for, um, you know, procedural approaches to pain or for physical therapy? So this is a nice way to guide your conversation about a broader approach to pain right there in the orientation group. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to just go back real quick to this slide. And then lastly, you'll discuss opioids, right? You'll talk about risk benefits, you'll talk about your policy, and you'll do the pain agreement. Uh, so as you can see, if you have a huge panel of patients who need to re-sign their pain agreements once a year, you might do like a quarterly um, orientation group. If you have a smaller panel of patients, you might do an annual orientation group and just kind of reorient people once a year and orient your new patients. Now, Moving on to another kind of group, the medication group. This one is probably more common than the orientation group. This is a group where you typically meet monthly. And in addition to providing brief support and treatment in the group around chronic pain, so psychoeducation, providing self-management support, you also assess people's pain, assess how your medicine is working, and provide a refill. So you're basically doing the work that you would do in an individual visit for a refill, but you're doing it with a group. So you're going to assess in a medication group the same items you would assess in a regular pain visit. Pain level, change in function, opioid side effects. Um, you do your own drug screens just like you would do in an individual visit. And you can do all of that with a structured intake questionnaire, right? Your medical assistant could hand out this intake questionnaire or could help patients fill it out depending on the literacy level of your patients. Um, or you could do it in conversation in the group and just sort of hear from people as you go around the room. We, um, I run a, or I co-lead a therapeutic group, but the first thing we do in every group is we do a check-in and we go around the room and everybody says what their pain score is today, and what's been impacting their pain, how it's impacted their function. So it's pretty easy just going around the room to get some sense of how people's pain treatment is working. 
And then you would offer the same treatments you would offer in uh, regular visits. You're going to offer non-opioid medication options. You're going to talk about non-pharmacologic pain management options. And you're going to refill the opioids. One note I wanted to make sure to make here, uh, sometimes talking about medications in a group setting, it can get complicated, right? Uh, if somebody's misusing their medication, you really do have to uh, contain that so that so that that doesn't become kind of standard practice in your group. On the other hand, if you're talking about risks for these medications, for the most part, I think patients get that and, and choose to be cautious unless they were heading down the addictive path anyway. But the other thing it can do is it can increase people's motivation to try new treatments. So we have a, a gentleman in our group right now whose life completely changed when he started paroxetine. Uh, like, to the extent that it's hard for me to believe that it was a paroxetine, but his life completely changed when he started paroxetine. And the guy is like a walking advertisement for paroxetine. Um, and so now anyone in our group who has heard him talk about his experience is actually willing to try the SSRI or the SNRI that their primary care provider is prescribing for pain. There's, there's much more openness to it because they've actually seen it work for somebody. There's a lot of value there if you can steer the group um, in the right direction. So there are a lot of ways to structure medi medication groups. Um, the, key, the, the key question that many people have around groups is how to bill for them. So in order for a provider to bill, um, it's, it's, it's beneficial if you have a little bit of individual time with the patient. Okay, you can, group, you can bill a psychotherapy group code but it doesn't um, reimburse as well as if the provider actually sees each patient individually. So a couple ways people do that. One is they do a group meeting for one hour, one and a half hours, and then they have brief individual visits after the group where any last things get tied up and a refill is provided. So that's one way. The second way, you have a group that's maybe a little longer, typically an hour and a half, and that group is run by someone other than the provider. So a behavioral clinician, a health worker, depending on the topic, you bring in a nutritionist, you're going to talk about nutrition. Um, it can kind of vary who runs the group. And during the group, patients step out for five, ten minutes to meet with the provider, get any sort of private stuff taken care of, and get refills that way. Those are both reasonable models that are both in use out there. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about the work of Jeff Geller, who is in uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, he has an entire practice of group visits. He runs about 30 groups a week. Um, and the way he does it is he has a partner who's, I think, a, a health worker, maybe a medical assistant, who co-runs the group with him. So he'll get the group kicked off, then he'll step out, the MA will continue to run the group, and he'll see patients one-on-one -on -one, uh, as they pop in and out of groups. And his experience is that patients want to get back to group because that's where they're having fun and learning. So they make their visits super, super brief with him and they just cut to the chase and get back to group. So if you can set up something like that, that can be a lovely way to, um, to cover all your bases. So lastly, I wanna talk about psychoeducational and therapeutic groups. And these are the ones that, that are probably the most intimidating for providers if they don't have a partner who is a behavioral clinician. Um, and so what I'm going to do at the end, just to give you a preview, I'm going to give you some resources of manuals that have been written for doing this um, and books you can use to guide you. And I just want to tell you, you can do it. If you can sit across from one patient and help them work through their suffering and the pain, you can also work with a group. Uh, to do that. In fact, in many ways, it's easier because all you have to do is let the group members take care of each other. So three models of group visits for chronic pain have been pretty well studied. One is the cognitive behavioral therapy model. Uh, and we'll talk, about, we'll talk about these. The other is the acceptance and commitment therapy model, which I think is less, less familiar to many people that has good data for uh, chronic pain treatment. And then the third is mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is another group model for helping people manage chronic pain. 
they're all good. They're all really good. Um, each of us, because of our own personal psychology, probably have a favorite, but they're all good. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about MBSR since Sharon covered that a little bit, but I am happy to answer questions about it at the end. We're mostly going to talk about CBT and ACT muscles. So most groups combine a formal therapeutic modality like CBT or ACT with some self-management education, so helping patients, for example, figure out how to take their medications appropriately, um, how to decide to slow down when they're having too much pain or how to keep themselves active when they're being too inactive, that kind of self-management education. And then, as you can tell, I think, by the way I've been talking, I think one of the primary things that groups do is they provide social support for patients, which is hugely, hugely lacking for them. Um, I'll tell you a quick story because I think I have time. Uh, we had a patient for a while in the chronic pain group who um, was in a wheelchair, and there was no physiological reason, but he was in an electric wheelchair. Nobody knew why. He had chronic pain all over his body. And every time we try to do, we start every group with three deep breaths, yeah? So every time we try to do the deep breathing, he would actually just wheel his chair out of the room, like he couldn't tolerate doing the deep breath. And I would follow him out and sort of check to see how he was doing. And he, was, he would usually be singing. That was how he coped with whatever feeling he was having. And then we would go back into the room and finish and, you know, restart the group after the three deep breaths. This went on for some time. As he sort of warmed up and got closer to us, he started actually being able to do the deep breathing um, it became clear that when he did the deep breathing, he was having, he said, he would say, it makes me think about things I don't want to think about. And so what it sounded like, he was, he was having some recurrence of some uh, PTSD related symptoms, right? Some intrusive thoughts were coming in when he relaxed his guard. And it became clear that probably his chronic pain was mostly a manifestation of PTSD. Uh, we came in the group one day. Uh, having improved over the course of the last couple of months, he sat down and he said, you know, I decided I wanted to tell my family something. And we all thought, oh, that's nice. What did you tell your family? And then he started to tell us about his trauma, which had been a childhood assault that I, I don't need to get into. But what was beautiful about the moment, besides the fact that he was wanting to share something, was that he had called the group his family. And what he had found in that group was somewhere that he could talk safely about something that he had been holding in his body for years. So that kind of support, that kind of, that sense that somebody understands me uh, is so rich and valuable. And, I, and I, I'm highlighting this because I think we get lost in feeling like we need to understand how to do CBT in order to run a group, or we need to understand how to do ACT. But truly, we just need to understand how to be with people. Okay, that said, let's talk a little bit about CBT, which is one of the primary psychological treatment modalities for chronic pain. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, basically the idea, and I think you guys are probably all familiar with this, is that your thoughts influence your feelings, and your feelings influence your behaviors, and they all kind of influence each other. And what we need to learn how to do is take a little bit of control and intervene on our thoughts so that we can change our feelings and change our behaviors, right? We'll notice our feelings so that we can go back and find out what automatic thoughts led to those feelings and change those so that we can change our behavior. Um, so CBT, you typically do some do homework where you are noticing thoughts and writing down alternative thoughts that might make make them less painful. Um, CBT is highly protocolizable, very amenable to writing manuals because you have these exercises, these uh, homework assignments, and of course a skilled CBT provider is more effective than a, an unskilled CBT provider. But the reason CBT has been so well studied is that it, it is so amenable to manuals and protocols, and so you can have, you know, 20 trained monkeys run the same group and do a randomized control trial on it. And so if you look out in the literature for manuals for chronic pain groups, they're almost all CBT manuals. So any of you 
could read a CBC manual, learn some of the tricks of the trade, and um, and try some of the techniques, either in your own practice or in a group. I'm going to skip this. And so then, in comparison, acceptance and commitment therapy is a little bit different. It's a little bit less manualizable and protocolizable, which neither of which are words, but I'm going to continue to use them. Um, so it helps people genuinely accept the current state of things. The, the acceptance is a big part of acceptance and commitment therapy. So you accept where you are. You stop fighting the fact that the pain is there, accept it, and then commit to moving forward from where you are towards the things that you value. So rather than wasting energy fighting this pain and wishing it weren't here and being angry that it's here, I drop that, I accept that it's here, and then I ask myself, what matters now? How do I get there? It is strongly influenced by mindfulness um, philosophy. Uh, and I'm going to show you, yeah, so often people explain, explain acceptance and commitment therapy through cartoons. There's a whole set of cartoons about HBP out there. Uh, but this is sort of an example of somebody pulling against their anxiety, their self-doubt, their sadness, their fear, and fighting this monster, which they're afraid is going to pull them into a hole. And then acceptance and commitment therapy says just drop the rope. Just let it go and let the self-doubt and anxiety and fear just kind of collapse because you're not pulling on it anymore, and then see what happens, then move forward from there. This is the way that um, ACT is conceptualized, that you start with being in the present up here at the top, focusing on the here and now, uh, accept what the present is, define what you value, and then make a commitment to move towards what you value. The other key features over on the bottom at 6 o'clock and uh, what is that, 8 o'clock, 7.30, um, are selfless context. So what that means is you, your inner world is actually the world that you live in. Understand that if you can get stable and steady and develop equanimity, um, you can you can create that in your life. You don't have to wait for your life to get perfect before you have it. And then diffusion, this other concept at 730, is learning how to step back and observe your thoughts without getting totally caught up in them. This is where it starts to sound a lot like mindfulness, or, as I said, closely related. So ACT really um, is a little bit harder to teach without having been immersed in it and trained in it. I think it's a, it, it's a very important perspective. Um, and what most of us do is we use a CBT-based model for our groups and then bring ACT principles in. So let that inform what we talk about with patients and the way we talk with them um, while using primarily a CBT approach. So let's talk about how you would build a group if you decided you wanted to do this. So this is, I'll just give you an example of what our CBT group looks like, or our team group, which is kind of a mixed CBT, ACT. We call it CBT plus love. That's actually the technical term. Um, so we start with three deep breaths. And you'll notice we also end with three deep breaths. So we kind of contain the session that way. We do a check-in, like I talked about, where we ask people about their pain and what's impacting it and what they're doing to cope with it. We deliberately make people talk about what they're doing to cope with it because we want people to engage in a little positive talk about their their own power over their pain. We then do a topic. So every session there's a topic. Uh, the topic might be sleep hygiene, which we've talked about a little bit already today. Um, it might be using your thoughts to cope with pain, or it might be anger and pain. It would be a list of topics. We then take a stretch break because we know that people can't sit very long when they have chronic pain. And then we do some kind of exercise, and that's almost always some form of a meditation. Uh, so we'll teach a mindfulness meditation or do a body scan uh, or do some deep breathing. And this is where we start to really help people develop the skills that they need to use those exercises effectively. And one of the things we check in about regularly in our check-in is what exercises have you been doing on your own and have they been working so that the group can start to motivate each other to get more engaged in the exercises. 
We then assign a personal project, which is our word for homework, because nobody likes work homework. Uh, and that, the personal project will be related to whatever the topic was for the day. So if our topic is sleep hygiene, the personal project might be make one change to your sleep routine and then report back and check it next week about how it went. Then we do take home points. This is one of the, I think, most powerful parts of the group where we go around the group and it's kind of the opposite of check-in. At check-in, people tell us how their week has gone. In take home points, they go around and everybody tells us one sentence, maybe even one word, of what they got from the group today that they want to take home and carry with them for the rest of the week. I often say, what seed, what seed did you hear today that you want to plant and have grow for the rest of the week? And people, and it's, it's actually a lovely way to get feedback about the group. You find out what hit home for people. Um, or often people will say, it really, it really struck me when so-and-so told his story about, you know, being sad about his daughter. And I realized I feel the same way sometimes, and it just felt good to connect. Um, so you get people giving feedback to each other about how their relationship and group is evolving. These are some of the topics um, that are often covered if you look at the manuals for chronic pain treatment. Hope and acceptance is a really big one. What does it mean to accept my pain? Does that mean I give up hope? How do I hold hope and acceptance at the same time? It's a nice topic to start, start early with. Sleep hygiene, communicating with your healthcare team. We give, we give instructions and tips on how to be efficient in talking with your healthcare team, how to get your point across. Um, we talk about pain medications, thoughts and pain, anger and pain, emotional pain and physical pain, how they're related, uh, social support, pacing. You can see there's a, there are a whole bunch of things you can spend your time with. In our group, we do 12 sessions per dose. So a patient can come to 12 weekly groups, uh, and then they have the opportunity to graduate. Uh, most of our patients don't really want to graduate after the first 12 groups, and how hard we push depends on whether we have a wait list or not. Um, usually after two sessions, so after 24 weeks, most patients are up for graduation, and we can then graduate and bring other people in. But different groups are modeled differently. Some people do eight weeks. Some people do monthly groups instead of weekly groups. I think mean, you can think about what works best in your setting and with the resources that you have. Uh, these are the things we hear from patients. I, I hear over and over again, I hear patients say, after that first group, I knew I wasn't alone and I knew that I had hope. And just that made it better. They're really impactful. Uh, and then bringing residents through the groups has also been very impactful. The residents show an increased interest in chronic pain patients. It's less like the slog and the person you don't want to be around, you start to really understand the depth of what's happening for them. Um, they get exposure to group visit model, which I think is great. And you actually hear them say, I, I enjoyed working with pain patients for the first time ever in my training. I actually enjoyed this. So here are some resources. This is a list of, um, of manuals, all CBT-based that are for chronic pain for people to use. I've worked a little bit with the first one um, and can vouch for its quality. And then we developed our own, as I said, CBT plus love model with a sort of ACT flavor thrown in. Um, and I'm happy to share that manual with people if you want to get started on a group. Happy to help out with that really in any way that I can. We also invite people to come visit our group. If you want, we meet on Mondays from 1 to 3. The group is from 1.30 to 3. And if anyone wants to drive up to San Francisco and check it out, we love visitors. And then there's just a couple of logistical tips if you're thinking about doing this. Um, think carefully about what time you offer the group. Chronic pain patients don't do mornings so well. You may have noticed in your panel, they tend to be better in the afternoon. Uh, because they tend to sleep poorly and on strange schedules. And so, so think about that and maybe talk to some patients about it. Um, establish a straightforward referral process. The hardest part of group is getting providers to remember to refer to you. Once you get patients in, you have probably a 50 to 70% retention rate once they come in the door. The hard part is getting them in the door. 
um, you know, which which it helps to have someone who understands the group making the referral because they can be much more convincing about it, which is another reason to have residents rotate through a group with you. Make sure that you have enough staff to call patients the morning of the group to remind and encourage them. Often they just want to stay in bed because they feel so lousy. Um, and so a little reminder encouragement call is helpful. Um, and considering it's useful to have a partner to run the group with you so that if something comes up and you need to step out, you have you have somebody who can keep things going or so that if you, you know, are out, the whole group doesn't have to get canceled. Um, we, so we have a model where I co-lead a group with a psychologist and, you know, if I'm out for a couple of weeks, she runs it, and if she's out for a couple of weeks, I run it, and we can kind of keep the group going. So that was a rapid download about various kinds of um, group visits. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to throw it back to um, Kelly. Here you go to help help us Great. run the rest of the show. We have a few, few minutes left, and um, Dana, thank you. It was very helpful, and I hope people found it very practical. Any comments or questions? I would like to know, um, as far as the the orientation for pain patients, that's something we don't currently have for our chronic pain patients in our clinic system. And uh, it would be nice to know, is, does somebody already have those resources like handouts or information that would give us uh, access to how to orient someone to getting their opioids prescribed chronically in this clinic, such and such, you know? Is there anything I could access that you got, any of you are aware of? Sure, I know Diana would be happy to share um, her information and we can make sure that's on base camp. In the clinic where I practice, we set up a, um, a new patient phone orientation um, where either a nurse or a very highly trained medical assistant would call every single new patient of the practice who is taking opioids and that became a screening question for every new patient of the practice. And then mm -hmm. that um, MA or nurse would walk through a series of checklists like you know, you need to get your records and we can't prescribe without those records or, and, you know, we may not prescribe on the first visit and this is the rules of the clinic and this is how we work and we, you and your provider will come up with a treatment plan which may include some behavioral health and, and we just say it was just kind of a nice way to orient people and then of course what we found is that there was a fairly high no-show rate because people who were just coming for opioids and were not as engaged in, in creating a treatment plan were less likely to want to join our clinic. Um, but sure. the goal was not to try and turn people away, it was to prevent drama on the first visit where a provider felt uncomfortable and was feeling pushed. So we'll, we'll put that on base camp as well. That's great. 